It was already past midnight when he reached the mountaintop. It was a calm, quiet night. The wind was softly caressing the lush greens as the moon was wrapping the mountaintop in its bright glance. His mission brief was very short and read, Zion Convoy, Dawn, No Prisoners. That meant he had a couple of hours to himself. He took a short glance to get a grasp of the distance. As he stood at the very edge of the cliff, gazing into the seemingly endless sea of pine trees, suddenly her voice echoed in his head. Where are you going, Daddy? Followed by a long silence. He kneeled down, gently touching her cheek with his fingers. Little did he know that the rough skin of his hands, the bruises and scars would feel like a grater on her skin rather than being comforting. Work, my dear. That's the best he could come up with. As he opened the door and stepped outside of their little wooden cabin, he could hear her words faintly. Daddy, don't go into the darkness. Her words faded away into a loud rush of gushing water and suddenly he woke up again. Maybe he could take a quick dive into the water to clear his mind. No. Instead, he grew more and more uneasy as the hours passed. He was not able to rid his head from all the thoughts that suddenly befell him ever since he remembered her words. His life has a purpose now. After all those years, it looks like he finally learned the value of a human being. His doubts were slowly rising, along with the sun on the horizon. A faint rumbling in the distance. The sea of pine trees began to move as clouds of dust shot into the air. Through his visor, he could make out a long tactical truck, flanked by two Zakus. The time has come. He readied his weapon and tried to focus. But there was only one thought in his mind. What if those guys down there also have someone waiting for them to come home? The trigger never felt so heavy. Whenever I start a new project, 99% of the time I already have a basic idea in my head, like a very rough sketch. In order to flesh out the idea, nothing beats a good image search on the internet. I stumbled across this photo. What really struck me was the overall composition of this really imposing mountain range with a wild river as a centerpiece, not to mention the beautiful autumn colors of a setting sun. This scenery would lend itself perfectly to all the techniques that I wanted to try to incorporate. With huge walls of stones, sprinkled with all sorts of trees and bushes, and on top of it, we have this raging stream running down this slope. As I was progressing through the rough layouting of the terrain, I had to admit to myself that I wasn't really feeling what I was building. Sometimes you just feel that you're off, and I had to scratch my initial idea and start anew. I'm showing this all to you not to waste your time, but to show you that the process sometimes is tough and a real struggle. Sometimes it might seem that through editing, everything seems like a walk in the park, but let me assure you, behind the scenes I was struggling a lot. So as it was, I started all over, this time with a new tool that I should have gotten way earlier. A hot wire foam cutter makes forming the terrain so much easier. With this, I was able to get my rough layout in no time. Just make sure that when you're using it, you better wear a respirator because the fumes are really toxic. If you have the chance, step outside and finish your work there. The steps that I'm doing here are practically the same that you saw before. The terrain paste is shredded toilet paper and regular plaster that I got from my local hardware store. Be sure to get one that gives you enough working time when mixed. Mine dried quite fast so I had to hurry accordingly. The rocks are leftovers from way back then when I made my first diorama. I have this habit of keeping all the scraps whenever I build something. That's especially bad when it comes to plow plate. I can never throw away any of them. Give a thumbs up if you are also someone who keeps everything no matter how small the pieces. While the terrain paste was drying, I tried to use the time wisely and created the structure for the waterfall. This is latex glue which dries transparent. In my head, I imagined that this would work perfectly as the body for the flowing water. To be sure, I made a couple more and put them to dry. Then it was time to commit to some decisions. For the base of the goof diorama, I chose to prime everything with mahogany brown and went from there. 
This time around, I wanted to go a different route and covered the entire piece with an acrylic wash made with wood by Vallejo. I deemed this a good choice because the other rod would have made the rocks too dark. Needlessly to say, there is no right or wrong way as both ways work fine. I did however add a second wash with a darker tone just to give the surface more detail and refinement. As a final touch, I added two layers of dry brushing, one with sand yellow and afterwards one with off white. And that's the painting part for the terrain done. With all the paint dry, it was time to take care of the cover. This was something that I wanted to pay extra attention to this time. I feel that a good seamless cover adds to the overall impression of a diorama and gives it its final touch. There are different materials that you can use to cover the rough and raw edges of your terrain. Last time I used thin balsa wood, but I found that it would be impossible to cut properly to match the silhouette of the diorama. So I opted for a 0.3mm plow plate. It is still sturdy enough while easy to cut, especially with scissors. Spots that are tough to reach were cut with a hobby knife and then just broken off. It's as simple as that. To glue the plow plate to the according sides, I used double sided tape. Once all the covers were set in place, I took a hobby knife and cut away all the protruding excess parts in order to make everything flush. No matter how clean you work, you probably won't be able to avoid holes between the terrain and the cover. To fill these, I used a pre-mixed plaster. This one here is meant for repairing wood, which I applied with a coffee stirring stick. This type of plaster has a really firm consistency which makes it easy to work with. Any spots which seemed too rough were smoothed out with my fingers which I dipped into water. To blend them into the terrain again, it was just a matter of painting them with the color that I used for the wash. Now, a landscape is never complete without some flora and fauna. Well, no fauna, but lots of flora, I would say. To prepare for that, I laid out a rough layer of dirt and rubble with the usual steps. First add PVA glue, then sprinkle the dirt over the surface. Once the glue dried, I dripped on some wet water to break up the surface tension, and to seal everything, I used diluted PVA glue. At this point, let me give you one piece of advice. I was using regular sand for the dirt surface, and to be honest, I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating. But on top of it, the grains are all of similar size, which in return results in a pretty even looking surface. Next time, I will try and get some real dirt with more variation in order to make the ground more realistic. Once the diluted PVA glue dried, it was time for another layer of PVA glue. This time though, it shall receive some lush grass instead of coarse sand. I whipped out my DIY static grass applicator and went to town with the grass. An important lesson that I learned during my last build, don't cover the entire surface with grass, instead leave out some spots. This makes for a more interesting landscape. With the grass added, the mountaintop already looks very nice. To give the sides more visual interest, I decided to add some flocking to them. I don't know if something like this exists and if bushes grow like this in the real world, and if it makes sense at all, but it felt correct. So I went on and I have to say that I like this look a lot. This was the flora part done. Next up for some more rocks and rubble. I paid extra attention to the spot where the river splits because I imagined the water would wash up lots of random stuff at that spot. Watching it now during the editing process, I almost feel like I could have added more. But well, it is what it is.
I sealed everything with wet water and diluted PVA glue once again and let it dry. A quick test fit left me in a positive spirit as I liked the result quite a bit. I took the diorama outside and primed the grass with Mr. Surfacer Mahogany. This step is not really necessary if you are using grass with the correct color. Mine however had a rather lush bright color mixed with yellow and red blades of grass. I think this product is called Scorched Grass. So I'm giving it a custom paint job with these Tamiya acrylics. Dark yellow goes on first. This lightens the entire scenery up a tad bit, also tying into the colors of the mountains. Since both colors are quite similar, you don't have to worry about overspraying. Next layer of color is this flat green. This will introduce a bit of saturation into the scene again, just to liven up the mood again. You also don't have to cover all the grass patches with this color, leaving some spots untouched will retain some color variation. This step already did a lot for the overall look of the diorama. The color palette is more coherent and pleasing to the eye. You also might have noticed that I primed the rocks. In order to give them a proper look, I hit them with flat earth. That is also a great opportunity to fix any overspray that occurred during the grass coloring. This time though, please do pay attention that you don't overspray any brown color onto the grass. You wouldn't want to go back and forth with color correction. Nice, so it's all slowly coming together. This next step is a bit tedious, but well worth it I would say. I prepared different sorts of browns and grey, and then I went and painted all the rocks bit by bit. This way I can give them more variation instead of leaving them in this mush of brown. Comparing the scenery before and after the paint job shows that now we have something that has a coherent and fitting color scheme. One final layer of dry brushing and the painting phase was done. And now my friends, let's venture into uncharted territory. Pouring a resin river and lake. Despite having seen so many projects where people used acrylic sheets, I opted for the tape solution for the dams. I figured that this would be okay since the pour is not that deep. I double sealed the tape by adding PVA glue to the borders of the outside and using UV resin for the border on the inside. This way I was hoping that I could prevent the resin from leaking. With my hopes up high and a bit of blind trust, I cracked open the package of resin water made by AK. Like most of these types of resin, this one is a two component product as well. The nice thing about the AK one is that it comes with two separate syringes for each component. So I'm mixing two part resin and one part hardener into a paper cup. To give the water some color, I added one drop of royal blue and military green by Vallejo respectively. I tried to stir as slowly as possible so that I won't introduce any bubbles to the mixture. Since I didn't have a compartment big enough to house the entire diorama, I used parchment paper as my single one layer of protection. Look at how confident I am. What a baller. I gotta say, pouring the resin is so so satisfying. The liquid has such a nice viscosity that when you watch it flow into all the nooks and crannies, you can't help but be delighted by it. To make sure that it covers the riverbed completely, I used a coffee stirring stick to push the resin around until everything looked leveled and smooth. And just look at how clear it is, it's so beautiful. In case you can't tell, I'm very enchanted by resin.
Even though the pour was not deep, there were still some bubbles forming. I used a lighter to pop them. I think it's a bit hard to see on camera since they are really small. That meant I had to come real close to the surface and be very careful with the flame. Once I was done, I covered the entire piece with a cardboard box and left it to cure. Alright, moment of truth. It's been 24 hours. Let's lift the cover and see how this one turned out. Oh. Okay. So this is looking pretty nice, I must say. Wow. It's to be fair, there was one spot which had a tiny bit of leaking when I checked it after a while in between, but I fixed it by sealing it with some UV resin from the outside. And that did the trick. Other than that, I would say it cured perfectly without any problems whatsoever. Good preparation pays off. All right, let's try and remove this. I hope the PVA glue. Uh, I can rid of get rid of that too. Yes, nice. It ooh. Ah, oh, I let yes, that works. Okay, so. Look how clean that is. The edge. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I can't stress how happy I was when I saw the outcome. Trying out something new for the first time and succeeding is such a nice feeling. Be aware, resin does creep up the tape during the curing process. So I took a hobby knife and cut away the excess on the edges. And this is what the diorama looks like after a successful resin treatment. Now it was finally time to take out the latex glue water stripes that I prepared ages ago. To give you a grasp on how long they just sat there while I was busy with all the other stuff, if I remember correctly, it was two weeks between setting up the glue and now finally removing it. But now here we are. I gave them a very rough paint job with cool white. I made sure that you could still see the brush strokes so it would look like fast flowing water. I left them to dry and did something that I felt was a good idea at that point. I used a rotary tool to carve out the resin edges where the water met the end of the riverbed in hopes that the latex glue stripes would sit flush with the water level. Well, apparently I did a very poor job as I hurt some of the terrain foam along the way. In hindsight, I would say this step was a waste of time and effort since I later went on and covered these spots anyways. I used UV resin to glue the latex stripes to the resin as this was the fastest way to attach them. Once the top was done, I focused on the bottom. This was a bit of a guessing game as figuring out the correct length was a bit of a trial and error process. To add some life to the water surface, I used Diorama FX transparent water paste made by Vallejo. This product allows you to create ripple effects on the water surface. I dapped it on very roughly, trying not to be too consistent with the brush patterns. Especially on the feet of the waterfall, I tried to create waves by brushing in concentric circles. As a final touch, I took a straw and blew air through it in order to push the paste around a bit and roughen up the ripples and then left it to dry afterwards. While the ripples were drying, it will take roughly a day depending on how large you painted them. I stole some poly fibers from an old pillow and prepared them by spreading and teasing them apart as much as possible. 
I'm using them to imitate the gushing water. They work better than cotton because the fibers are stronger and sturdier than cotton. Plus, cotton is very very finicky to work with once you add glue to it. So I worked my way along the waterfall and added some volume to both of the streams. The next was a bit of a lucky shot. I didn't know if it would work out and took a leap of faith. I diluted some of the ripple effects paste with water, enough to get it flow into a pipette. Then I drizzled some of the mixture onto the streams. I was trying to mimic spitting water that would splash away from the stream. For a lack of better words, here's a picture. To simulate the foam, I mixed ripple paste with some baking powder. A lot of people use white snow flocking for that effect. But since I don't have this at my disposal, I had to use baking powder. Which I know works just as good thanks to Jordi's extensive research. So yeah, once more, thanks Jordi for sharing your results. Be sure to mix the paste well, let it sit for a bit and let the carbon dioxide do its magic. Once the chemical reaction is over, you have a nice foamy sturdy paste to work with. Just be sure not to mix in too much of the ripple paste or you will get a mushy goo. When you got the right consistency, it's such a pleasure to work with. I tried not to overuse it and apply it only to selected spots where the water would hit a hard surface. To refine the foam texture, you can use a toothpick to create thinner ripples. One thing I wish I would have done differently is that next time I would add white paint to the mixture. I forgot that the ripple texture dries transparent and because I didn't account for that, I had to add some extra white paint afterwards. For this step, make sure to use an old beaten up brush because the paint will come on very rough and random exactly the way we want. The very last step was to get out the toothpick again, dip it in white paint and stipple across the tail of the foam. The pointy tip makes it really easy to draw in fine strokes and work in really nice white water details into the rippled surface. And that was the paint job. I feel like at this point we've already come a long way and already have a really nice looking scenery. However, there's one thing that I wanted to add before I call it finished. I finally got around to buying some sea foam trees. I've seen them so many times in other people's projects and wanted to give it a shot myself. And boy, what a revelation that is. Using them is so easy and the result is so mind-blowing. I'm using them in the most basic form there is. I cut them to an appropriate size, dipped them into PVA glue and then sprinkled some coarse turf over them. And just like that, I had a tree. I made a bunch of them in no time so that I could spread them across the terrain. Now I know they might be way off in terms of scale, but as a matter of fact, this whole diorama is all over the place when it comes to correct scale. In a future project, I would love to dive deeper into creating bigger trees and explore the possibilities of sea foam. For now my friends, all that was left to do was to place the GM into place and the diorama is finally done. You've seen all the beautiful shots in the beginning of the video, so I'm leaving you with a couple of turntable shots. Speaking of which, please let me know what you thought about the intro. Doing an acted narration like that was definitely out of my comfort zone. All that is left for me to do now is to thank you for your time. I've learned so much along the way that I'm all too excited to dive into the next project. So I will see you there. Stay safe and take care my friends.